you have your Bibles with you, go ahead. Turn with me to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. And we're going to spend some time looking at some valuable truths from God's Word from that Psalm, Psalm 63. The whole Psalm is what we're going to meditate on this morning. And so uh, I'm going to get Brother to read the, the Scripture for us. Would you follow along with your, with your Bible? Psalm 63, the first, I mean, the whole chapter, verse 1 to 11. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. We say amen to God's word. If your Bible has, you know, one of those titles on top of the chapter, uh, it would read something like the Psalm of David uh, regarding a time when he was in the wilderness of Judah. So that's when David composes this psalm and sings it to the Lord. Many Bible scholars believe that the reason why David was in the wilderness of Judah was because of his son Absalom. You know, many of us are familiar when Absalom revolted against David, threatened to take his throne. David had to flee Jerusalem and go into the wilderness and literally flee for his own life. And it was in this kind of a situation that David pens this psalm, which gives kind of an insight into the heart of David, where his, where his focus lay on. Regardless of what was happening around him, the language that you see David use in the psalm gives you a snapshot of where his heart was. Now in our city, most of the reputable hospitals in our city have a service that's called a master health checkup. Yeah? Normally, when you hit 40 or some critical age, it's, it's advisable for you to go and get yourself tested, checked out. You know, and if you ever go to one of these uh, master health checkups, one of the things that happens is you would have to sit with a doctor at some point in the day where they get to ask you some questions. You know, the doctor asks questions like, what's your diet like? What do you eat? You know, how do you sleep? Do you exercise? You know, what's your lifestyle? By asking several questions, the doctors kind of diagnose what it is that's going on with your life and then gives certain counsel on how you can improve your health a little bit by changing certain things in your life. Now, I'm going to parallel that to what I would like to call this morning a spiritual diagnosis. Yeah, we're going to look at Psalm 63 uh, as a spiritual diagnosis, and I'm going to put in front of you seven questions that we're going to draw from that psalm. We're going to ask ourselves these questions in regards to our spiritual life. And where do we stand when we ask these questions? Now, in no way are these questions meant to condemn. No way are these me questions meant to make people feel bad. But these questions are meant for every child of God to do an examination of where our heart is. And then when we find shortcomings, we work at changing that. Just like, you know, doctor says, you've got to change certain things. You're going to expect God to speak to you this morning, the Holy Spirit to, to touch your heart and say, hey, that's one area that you're still lagging a little bit behind. I want you to make some effort in changing that. 
And as we are open to him, he's going to speak to us. How many of you are ready to hear him speak this morning? Come on, we can do a better amen than that. Amen. All right. Remember, third time's a charm. Amen. Okay. Number one, when you look at this psalm, the first question that I want to put in front of you is from the first verse. The psalmist says, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. That was his cry. Now, taking into consideration the context in which he makes this prayer, he is running for his life. A lot of things are happening all around him. But in the midst of it, his focus still remains on God. His focus still remains on seeking God. And the word, earnestly, I will seek you. In the Tamil Bible, uh, it's used in transliteration, which is, I will seek you early in the morning. That's what earnestly, the actual text was meant to say. Earnestly, I will seek you in the morning. In other words, David was saying, Lord, in my life, no matter what happens or does not happen, this one thing will not change. I'm going to begin every day seeking you. I'm going to begin every day looking for you in my life. I don't want to begin a day without you. I don't want to live a day without you. I don't want to end a day without you. So I'm going to seek you before every single day. Now, if we're going to ask that question to ourselves, then the question is, in all our priorities in our life, what position does God take in our priorities? Does God find himself in the top 10 of our priorities? Does he find himself in the top five? Or is God the first of our priority? Because it's one thing to say it verbally. It's another thing to actually live it out. Because it's easy to say, God is my first priority, Pastor. God's the first one I see. But in the course of life, let's say from Monday through Saturday, as you live through the days of your life, do you begin every day by saying, Lord, I, I really want you to be involved with, with this day. I want you to be with me today throughout all that I do. As you wake up in the morning, what is it you reach for first thing? What's the closest thing next to you? Most of us, it's the phone. You know, the first thing we look for is messages. Who texted me last night when I was asleep? The first, you know, in, in Tamil, we, we make this phrase, you know, whose face did you, you know, see? Because it, it, it kind of determines someone's day. That's what a lot of people believe. It's, if you saw someone's lucky face, and you're going to have a lucky day. In, in the kingdom, it's not such. There's one thing that is still the same, which is anyone who seeks God, first thing in the morning, can expect that day to be God-ordained, God-blessed, and God-fulfilled. And I think for every child of God, this should become such an integral part of our lifestyle, where our day begins with seeking God. In your life, is that something that you could look back and say, yeah, Pastor, on, on Monday through, through Saturday, when I go through the week, God, God's got the first place in my life. He's the center of my life. Everything revolves around him. Every, every, every decision I make, I, I, don't, I don't do it on my own. That's what David did. As you read through the life of David, every single time he was about to do something, he would first go seek the Lord. So can I do this? Can I go out for war? Can I, can I attack this person? All the time, David was checking with God. Are you with me when I do this? And this should become a prayer for every child of God. And that's why David begins his psalm in the midst of despair. He says, Lord, earnestly I will seek you, you know? In the Bible, there's many scriptural references that talk about first place, first, you know, and you can look through the Bible, and there's several examples that I can give you just, just on the top of my head. You know, all of us know Matthew 6, which is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Those were the words of Jesus. As he's teaching the disciples, he says, in my kingdom, I want my disciples to live their life focused on me, on the kingdom. I want you to begin your life, begin your day with seeking me and my kingdom and the priorities of my kingdom needs to take first place in your life, Jesus says. Now the psalmist says in Psalm 27, verse 4, he says, one thing I have desired of the Lord. 
and I will seek after. And what's the one thing he desires? What's the thing that he seeks after? He says that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That was his desire. One thing. That's what I ask every day. Lord, I'm beginning this day with this one request. I want to know you more. I want to experience you in a greater measure in my life. That's what the psalmist was praying for. You know, in, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul, the apostle, also says that word, which is one thing, he says. He says, but one thing I do, he says. What's the one thing I do? I forget what's behind me, and I lean towards what's ahead of me. And what's, to, what's ahead of me? It's the call of God upon my life and the price of the obedience of his call. That's what I'm straining towards every day. That's the one thing I do every day. If you're going to ask me, what's the one thing you're doing today? I'm walking towards the purpose of God. I'm walking towards God in my life. And that's the one thing I do. This needs to be said about children of God. When we talk about our life, our priorities, what we spend our time with, it needs to be God takes a great big portion of the pursuit of my life and all the things in my life. You know, Luke chapter 10, a lot of us are familiar with this incident, you know, with Mary and Martha, Jesus visiting, and Martha getting upset with Jesus, you know, and then coming and screaming at Mary in front of Jesus. And then Jesus looks at Martha and says these amazing words. And what does Jesus say? Martha, Martha, Martha. One thing is needed. And Mary has found and chosen the good part. And it shall not be taken away from her. So Jesus is saying one thing. That's all that's needed. And what's the one thing he was talking about? He's talking about being seated at his feet. He says, one thing, that's all you got to do for your life to work out, for everything to fall into place, the one thing that determines the flow of your life, every aspect of your life, is it needs to be God-focused. God needs to be the center of our pursuit on a daily basis, Lord. It's a prayer that we all need to make on a daily basis. Lord, I don't want to begin this day if you're not going to come with me. I want you to be with me in all that I do, like Jabez prayed. Lord, I want you to bless the work of my hand. And I'm telling you, the more we become God-focused, the more we experience the providence, the sovereign reign of God in our life. Can I hear an amen? You know, David, in his life, this was an unchangeable habit. Regardless of what happened, he says, Lord, even if I'm in the wilderness, even if I'm running for my life, I'm going to still keep doing what I've always done, whether I'm in the palace or whether I'm in a tent. I'm going to seek you first thing in the morning. I'm going to pursue you. Earnestly, I will seek you because I desire for you, David says. The second verse, as you look at it, the second part of that first verse, David says, he says, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints just like in a dry and weary land where there is no water, he says. So then the second question that we can ask ourselves for spiritual diagnostics is, do we desire God genuinely? Is there a hunger for God in us on a daily basis? Is that something that we can say, say I'm, I'm really hungry for God, Pastor. I want to see, experience, to know God in a greater, intimate way in my life. David had this. He uses a language that's so intense. He says, my, my, my flesh, it cries out for you. My soul thirsts for you. And think about it. He's in the wilderness. He's surrounded by dry, desert kind of a, a terrain. And so, obviously, he would have been thirsty physically. Obviously, he would have been hungry physically because he's running from his own son with no food, no water. He's in the wilderness. And yet when he pens down a psalm, his focus was not his natural hunger. His focus was a spiritual hunger, saying, Lord, I thirst for you. I hunger for you. I want you like water is needed in a dry, weary land. That's how much I desire you in my life, he says. Another psalmist, he says, Psalm 42, verse 1, he says, the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O oh my God. It's this innate hunger for God and to know God 
that is a spiritual insight to where we are. Do we have a desire for God in our life on a daily basis? St. Augustine, he said this, he says, the whole life of a good Christian is a holy desire, he says. Meaning there's this unquenchable hunger within a Christ follower from the day he meets Jesus to want to know him more, to want to experience him on a deeper, greater level in his life. Psalm 73, verse 25. Again, the psalmist says, whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. He says, Lord, there's no one else I can take my prayers to. There's no one else I can take my problems to. There's no one in heaven except you. You are it. You're the only one who I can bring my sorrow to, my challenges to, my prayers to, because if you don't answer, I have no one else to turn to. That's what the psalmist was saying. Whom have I in heaven but you? I have no one. There's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. It's this, even though he was a king, he had everything he, he, he could have ever dreamed of. He says, when I have all the things around me, there's still this desire that's within me that I want to know you more. I want to hunger for you more. I want to experience you in a greater measure. I'm asking us this morning, you know, has God become an obsession in our life? Is this something that you think about in, in your day-to-day? -day? God, I, I, I really desire to know you more, to experience you in a greater measure in my life. This needs to be the cry of every Christ follower saying, Lord, on this brief time that we're on earth, may my life be spent in pursuit of your presence, of your glory, of the things that you have for me. I want to search it and find it out. There was a king who visited an orphanage one day. The orphanage was filled with blind little boys. And along with the king came a minister who accompanied him to this visit. And obviously the minister wanting to impress the king, when they gathered all the boys together, he put this question, you know, to the boys. He said, hey boys, if ever your eyes would ever be open." Who would you like to see first thing as soon as your eyes are open? And all the young boys shout, oh, we want to see the king. We want to see the king. The first person when our eyes are open. And the king was smiling, happy. And yet there was one kid in the front who did not respond. He had his head down and he did not answer the question. So the king walked up to him and tapped him on his shoulder and said, hey, I don't know if you heard the question, but the question we we're asking is, if ever your eyes are open, who would be the first person you would like to see? The boy looked up and he said, the first person I would like to see when my eyes are open is Jesus, he said. And the king was a little bit perturbed, but didn't want to give up. So he said, all right, sure, you can see Jesus. But after Jesus, who is the second person you want to see after your eyes are open? And the boy smiled and said, king, if I see Jesus, there's no one else I need to see after him. That should be our, our desire. It says, that's what, I, that's what we want in our life. Lord, if, if we find you, we found everything. If we have you, we have the world. We have all that we need for our life if we know Christ. This is what was Paul's desire and prayer. This is what David's cry was. And I'm telling you, a spiritual diagnosis about our life is, do we desire God for more than just a blessing? Do we come to God just to put in a list of requests. Do this for me. Do that for me. Get this sorted out for me. It's like a, you know, God's our butler that we can, you know, boss him around till he gets our job done. And then we say, see you. Thank you. That's not who our God is. He's a personal God. He's a savior who came to earth for one purpose to, re to restore relationship between you and him on a personal level, which means God desires so much that we know him or are known by him, which means one of the greatest pursuits for a Christian is to know him in an intimate way. This should become an obsession for all of us in our day-to-day -day life. Lord, I want to know you. I want to teach my heart to recognize your voice when you speak to me. I don't want to be spiritually 
dead. I don't want to be hardened. I want to have a heart that hears when you speak. David had this desire in the midst of calamity. He was still saying, Lord, even though everything is crumbling around me, I still want you. I want you in my life. I desire for you. I'm thirsty for you. Would you please meet with me? That was his prayer. Next part of that psalm, David says in verse 3 onwards, he says, Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live. Lifting up my hands to you in prayer, he says. So question, the third question is, do we worship God? Do we worship God? Maybe you're seated here like, duh, pastor. That's a very obvious question. And of course we worship God. That's we're all seated here. I want you to look into this question a little bit deeper with me. Because a lot of times, I think we have a misunderstanding of what worship actually is. For most Christians today, if you were to ask them, what is worship? They would describe to you what happens once a week at church when they gather together. The time of singing, the time of praising, that's worship for a majority of Christians today. Um, I want to tell you, that is not what the Bible describes as worship. This 30 minutes or 40 minutes that we spend together on Sunday does not constitute as worship in a Christian's life. It's a part of worship, but it is not fully worship. Because worship was never meant to be limited to one day or one hour or half hour of a week. Worship was meant to be a lifestyle for you and me. Worship was supposed to be something that we live and breathe on a daily basis. You know, sometimes we, we, we see it topsy-turvy. We see worship as something we do once a week that will sustain us through the rest of the week. But actually, how God meant it was to have worship as a lifestyle every day where you have learned to worship God on a daily basis and out of the out overflowing of an everyday walk with God, you come in to the corporate worship and you have the greatest, grandest celebration. But we see the corporate worship as a substitute for personal worship. That's not how it works for all of us. This is something that God desires, worship. God desires worship from us because he is the only one who's worthy of worship. And worship needs to become a daily part of our life. And worship is not limited only to singing. Just because we sing does not mean it's worship. It's part of worship. Worship is so much beyond that. Meaning every time you open your mouth and begin to just lift up God in your life. Just talk about his goodness, his greatness, what he has done in your life. Every time in your personal life, the moment you begin to ascribe to God what he has done, that is worship. And every child of God needs to have a personal time in their every day where it's separated for worshiping God. It's not just listening to some songs. It is to actually allow worship to be birthed in us that begins to flow from our deep man, the spiritual man, and go to God. That's our worship and honor to God. Do we worship him in our personal life? Is that something that's part of our everyday, you know, walk with God where we actually just, you know, because worship, when you see scripture, it's with our lips. It's with our hands. It's with our voices. It's not just good thoughts towards God that's worship. Because all of us have good thoughts. Oh, God is so good. I, you know, I'm always thinking about how good he is. Thinking is not worship. Worship is opening our mouth and speaking and honoring him. The Bible uses words like raise your voice, lift up, a shout. All these are pertaining to worship, which means for all of us in our personal life, there has to be this habitual coming into the presence of God and worshiping Jesus Christ and saying, you, 
and you alone are worthy of my worship. There's no one on planet earth who compares to you. You are incomparable, immeasurable, unmatchable. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You have blessed me with food and water. Lord, I honor you today with everything that I am. I give you praise. I worship you. This has to happen on a daily basis in our life. And when that becomes a lifestyle, and then we come together, Imagine how explosive this place would be because no one can stop us from being quiet. And yet, could it be that we struggle so much with worship because we have not built the altar of worship in our personal life? Could it be that so many of us prefer to skip worship when we come together corporately because we don't know how to worship? We have never taught ourselves, our spiritual man, to actually worship God. And because of that inability to worship God, we would rather skip the part which is the most amazing part of our time together, which is to lift up Jesus, the name above all names, the name under which every knee shall bow, which is the most glorious part of our time together. We would rather skip it so that we can come and sit and listen to a preacher tell us how good God will be to us. Spiritually, where are we today? Have we learned to build an altar to God? on a daily basis? If not, the Spirit of God is speaking to us because God is a personal God. He wants us to know Him and to be known by Him, to hear His voice. God, that's the whole purpose of the Christian faith. That's what separates a Christian faith from every other faith. It's not a religion. It's not a set of rules and regulations. Christianity is relationship. That's what Christianity is all about. That's the one reason why Jesus left his throne to come down to earth because he didn't want a middleman to represent God and man. He didn't want us to go to a high priest and have the high priest take our request to God. He says, I'm going to cut the middleman. I'm going to tear the curtain that separates us because I'm coming down to earth. I'm shedding my precious blood. I'm purchasing freedom for everyone. And by the purpose of his freedom was for you and me to enter into his throne room personally. For every person to experience God in a personal way, in your home, to have the presence of God fill your prayer room. Have we ever been lost in his presence in our prayer time? Where we just, just sat there weeping and crying. This is not something that's reserved for the super spiritual or someone who's only in ministry. No, it's for every child of God to experience God in such a manner that it becomes an obsession for our life. After all, we're going to spend eternity with him. Isn't that the whole point of the Christian faith? To believe for what is to come. To be with him for eternity. Do we worship God? The fourth question that I want to put before you is from verse 5. And the psalmist says, he says, You satisfy me more than the richest feasts. I will praise you with songs of joy. You satisfy me more than the richest feast, he says. Now, a question I can put from there is, have we learned to enjoy God? That's a strange question. Have we learned to enjoy God. Or in other words, from this scripture directly, have we learned to feast on God? Do you know, do we know what it means to feast on God? Because that's what David is saying. He says, you satisfy me more than the richest feast. And if anyone knew what a rich feast would be like, it would be David. He's from the palace. He's had a few feasts in his belt line. And yet he says, God, when I compare all the feasts, I find more satisfaction in your presence than the richest of feasts that I could ever enjoy. Do we enjoy God? Have we become, now in, in Tamil, I was able to find a more appropriate words, which is strange because I'm normally better at English than Tamil, but somehow it got turned around today. 
But my Tamil, uh, the point that I had for verse, I mean, point four, the question four was, Devane nam rasithi rusikka palagiru kroma. Devane nam rasithi rusikka palagiru kroma. Have we learned to adore him and savor in his goodness? Transliteration. Adore him. Today we have so many fans. You know, fans for that worship leader, fans for that preacher. You know, sometimes you have people, oh, I'm a big fan of yours. And I'm telling you, in the Christian faith, there's no such thing as a fan. There's only one who is deserving of all honor, all glory, all adoration. It's our Savior. We cannot become sidetracked with looking at human beings, people, and, and thinking that they're great, because none of us are. There's only one who is deserving of our absolute adoration, adulation. He is our God. And it needs to become such a, a part of our life, which is we just adore God. Adore everything about God. You know, I'm a father of a, of, a, of a six-month-old baby, and I'm telling you, I'm madly in love with that little baby. I, whenever I, she's with me, I'm just talking goo goo gagas with her, and I'm, we just have the grandest of times. I cannot stop telling her how adorable she is. And it reminded me, this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my Heavenly Father. I'm supposed to be obsessed with him. Every waking hour, I'm going to have to, t uh, this, what I need to learn to do is just, Lord, there's no one like you. There's no one who is amazing as you. There's no one in all of this galaxy, in this universe, that could ever compare to your greatness, to your beauty, to your splendor, to your majesty. Lord, every day when I wake up, I'm amazed at what you do and what you have done. If you read through the Psalms, so many Psalms have, have phrases like, how great are the works of your hand, O Lord? How marvelous are your deeds? How do those words be birthed in the psalmist? I'm telling you, it's because he came out one morning and saw a, sun, a sunrise, and he looks at the incredible grandeur of the sunrise, and he starts penning his psalm, saying, how great are the works of the hands of the Lord? Meaning, he's adoring everything about God, every aspect about God. And you and I, we need to have one obsession, it's our Savior, the lover of our soul, who needs to be the object of our affection, adoration. Not man. The reason? Man disappoints. Man fails more often than not. And if you're following some leader, preacher, I want to tell you, you're going to be very disappointed one day because they will fall far short of your expectation. And if your adoration was them, your faith is going to be shaken. Only one person is due our adoration, worship, and honor. It is our, our God, Christ Jesus, our Savior. <clears throat> you know, taste and hunger go hand in hand. Okay? Let me explain what I mean by it. When you're not hungry, things are not tasty. But when you're hungry... Anything can be tasty. Yeah? For example, like this week, do an exercise. Don't eat for two days. And then have just plain rasan sor. Every bite you take, you'll be like, oh, it's the best thing I've ever had in my life. You know, you would have been complaining, there's not enough salt, there's not enough all this time. But the moment you haven't eaten for two days, when hunger... It's there, everything tastes. But when there's no hunger, you could have the tastiest food set before you're like, eh, I've had better. Is it possible that today, children of God have lost their hunger for things of God? Because they've learned to satisfy their hunger with the fleeting things of this world. And because of that, they have lost the appetite for eternal things. This is the scheme of the enemy. Very successful at it. You know, my, my, my children, when they go to play with the grandparents, I'm not going to tell you which grandparents they go to play with. Could be my, my wives or, or, my, or mine. 
But when they go to play with the, the grandparents, normally sometimes in the evening, just before dinner, we have them go get their energy out. And then while they're with them, one granddad feeds my kids sugar. A cup of Horlicks, two candies, one chocolate, one slice of cake. Now, I'm ob oblivious to this. I'm thinking they're having fun running around doing things. So I come back when it's time for dinner and say, come on kids, let's go, let's go have dinner. So take them, sit them at the table, put the food in front of them. Eh, not hungry, daddy. Get on the phone and ask them, please give me the list of all the things you gave. And nine out of 10 times, they've had biscuits, they've had a slice of cake, Oh, they only had a cup of Horlicks. It's very healthy for them. The problem with all of these things that they ate was it's primarily sugar. And any doctor will tell you sugar has no nutritional value whatsoever. There's no vitamin D. There's no vitamin A. There's no zero nutritional value. But what sugar does is it suppresses appetite. Yeah? And what sugar does is it makes it feel so good. Now you eat sugar and you're the happiest person. Suddenly you have endorphins in your body. You're like, hey, the world is so nice. And then when it goes away, there's a crash. That's what they call it. No nutritional value, but it suppresses appetite. And that's exactly what's happening today in the spiritual realm. The enemy has gotten so many children of God eating things that have no nutritional value, that are fleeting that really do not satisfy, but it deters them from the things that truly satisfy, the things that really matter, we've lost the hunger for it. Could it be possible to recover that desire for God and the things of God if we could fast from things that have suppressed our appetite, whether it be social media, whether it be a t television show, or whether it be a relationship. All of these things that the enemy has strategically placed in your life, for one purpose, it is to suppress your appetite. And if we could only remove those things, I'm telling you, you will rediscover the hunger and thirst for the things of God. And he truly satisfies. When you come to God, you find every good thing. That's what the Bible says. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. In your presence, we have all that we need. I'm telling you, we need to rediscover this incredible art of savoring, adoring, enjoying the presence of God. David had this. It's, it was meant to be part of our Christian walk, to have this incredible moments and experiences where we have such a glimpse of the glory of God and say, Lord, we're longing, we're longing, we're longing for that which is to come because I've had a taste of what it really would be like. And the more I taste, the more I hunger, the more I want more of it. And that's, you can see the pattern in the Bible. Moses had the same problem. The more he saw God, the more he wanted God. He had face-to-face -face encounters and says, Lord, I still want to see your glory because it becomes an obsession in our life because when you taste God, it becomes this unquenchable hunger in us. It says, I want to have more and more and more and more of him. But what the devil does is, he stops us from that first bite, which produces in us this quest of hunger for knowing more of him. David, in the midst of his wilderness, he says, Lord, more than all the richest feasts in my life, I still find satisfaction in you. That's who that truly satisfies my life. Time is beyond me. Number five. Verse six, he says, when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, he says. So the fifth question I'm asking for self-diagnosis is, do we think about God in our everyday life? Does God take place in our thought life? Think about it. David is running for his life, hunted for his life by his own son would have had similar to you and me, which is sleepless nights. And that's exactly what's happening with him. He's lying in bed, sleep does not come. But instead of spending all his nights 
wondering about how he's going to you know, get his throne back, David writes this psalm and he says, when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, he says. Now, there's a difference of approach between how the world sees meditation and what the Bible teaches as meditation. You know, India, the land of yoga, and many other meditation the common philosophy is, if you want to enter into a state of meditation, you have to clear your mind. You have to empty yourself to be able to clearly meditate. But the Bible says something different. The Bible says if you want to meditate, you've got to fill your mind. You've got to fill your mind with what? With his word. Because that's what the Bible says. Meditate on your word day and night, and I shall be like a tree planted by the rivers side, and I shall give fruit in due season, and all that you do will prosper. So the Bible teaches that that's what David was doing, meditate, meditating at night. And so what he's talking about meditating is, he's, he's thinking about God. He's thinking about the words of God, the word of God. That's what he's dwelling upon, and such an important part of our spiritual walk, which is as a child of God, takes in God's word, the Holy Spirit fills our heart with his word. And when the time comes, when it is needed, the spirit of God brings what has been implanted in our heart and uses it to strengthen us and to restore us and to encourage us. Psalm 119, you read through the whole psalm. It's all about the word of God, the law of God. It talks about the meditation of God and how that produces the strength, this grace. And David, as he lay in bed, he is thinking about the word of God, the promises of God. He's probably saying, Lord, you anointed me as king by Samuel. And you said that my kingdom will be established. So I'm going to hold on to that word. Lord, you, 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 you've rescued me from the bear, from the lion. You can also rescue me from my enemies today. All through the night, he's meditating on God's word. And as he meditates on God's word, he is being strengthened on the inward. This is the power that the Word of God produces in us. The more you meditate on it, the more it produces strength and faith in us to go through what we're going through. So the question is, do we have the habit of reading and meditating God's Word? Because that is the secret of strength during time of calamity. The Word of God is strength for time of despair. I remember when I was in Bible school, one of the teachers was trying to teach us the importance of reading the Bible and studying it every day. And so he used an illustration that I still won't forget. You know, he used a parable and he said, you know, what if I told you to go out every day and pick up rocks and put it in a bag and bring it home and fill a room? How many of you would be excited to do it? Show of hands. No one lifted their hands. And he said, yes, it seems very boring, very tedious, monotonous stuff to go out every day, pick up rocks, put it in a bag, and fill a room. And he said, what if I told you, after years of you doing that, suddenly you find out that every rock contained gold in it? Would you be excited that you had done it? Every hand went up. Yes, I would be excited to have done it. And he said, that's exactly what reading the Bible is like. And he said, when you read the Bible, most times you're not having this God-shattering moment when you're reading Scripture. It's just Scripture. You're reading it, and sometimes it doesn't even make relevance to what you're going through, but you're reading it. But what's happening is, as you're reading Scripture, something is happening in the spiritual realm where the Spirit of God is taking the written Word of God and He's implanting in your heart. And as you keep reading, as you keep reading, He's filling your heart with His Word and time will come when you're going through something and you don't know what to hold on to, what to cling on to. In that moment, the Holy Spirit comes in and pulls the Word of God from the depth of your heart and puts it in your mind and says, trust in me, I'm with you. Do not be afraid. I will help you, I'll help, help you go through what you're going through. And it is those moments where if you've reserved your heart with the Word of God, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to strengthen us, to enable us, to be able to give us the encouragement that we need during time of need. That's what David was doing. 
He was meditating on the Lord through the watches of the night. Do we think about God? Do we meditate on his word? Do you have the habit of having had read your Bible in the day, in the morning, and then spending the rest of the day coming back to it again and again? So what did I read today? Oh, Lord, thank you for that passage that I read today. I'm going to take that for myself, what Paul prayed for. The eyes of my spiritual understanding to be open. I'm going to pray that for myself. And to keep coming back to God's word, meditating on it, does something to the inner man in strengthening us. In, in preparing us for what we may face in the day of battle. Do we meditate? Do we think about God? I'm already beyond my time, so I'm going to give you six and seven bonus. All right, six and seven, just the questions, and you do the rest of the thinking at home. Number six, from verse eight, David says, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. In the old King James, it says, my soul followeth hard after thee, it says. Meaning, I'm pursuing you every day without giving up. Do we pursue God? Do we pursue him on a daily basis? Pursue his, his grace, his favor, his blessing. David says, I follow you hard every single day, he says. And finally, seventh question I'm going to just put in front of you and pray with us. Verse 7, David says, For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. And then the rest of the verses from 9 to 11, David then makes a declaration of what God will do for him. But then basically, the seventh question is birthed out of David saying, You have been my help, meaning you've done it in the past, and I'm going to trust you to do it again for me. The question is, do we trust God? Do we trust God with what you're facing today? Do you trust that God will get you out of the mess that you're in today? Do you trust that God will give you favor, will give you wisdom? Because David says, he says, you've, you've been my help. Because you've done it in the past, I want to keep trusting you. Because you are Ebenezer. Thus far, you've helped me. And you're able to help me tomorrow as well. So my, my prayer is today, you know, obviously the time that we've had together does not justify these soul-searching questions I put in front of you. And my prayer is that for all of us, we would take time this week in our personal prayer time to do what David did often, which was to pray the prayer of, Lord, examine my heart. Is there anything in me that's displeasing to you? Is there anything in me that's stopping you from doing your work? Please, Help me deal with it. Let this be our prayer today, church. That we will become a generation that pursues God fully, with full heart, full strength, full mind. My prayer is that today there will be a deep calling of the deep where those who are here would not write off your prayer time as something that's just monotonous and a chore, but rather you will enter into a sphere in your personal walk with God where you're tasting him for yourself, experiencing God's incredible grace and his presence like it was meant to be. God meant for all of us to experience him in such great measures here on earth as a foretaste of what is to come. Would you stand with me? I want to pray with you today. My goal today is to whet your appetite to want to see more of God in you. To make a prayer today that says, Lord, let me not be satisfied with the fleeting things of this world. I pray that I would hunger and thirst after righteousness after the things that you truly have for me that brings true satisfaction. And I pray that many who are here today will come into a deeper walk with God, where you don't rely on other people to, you know, intercede for you for God, but you have learned to come into God's presence yourself and to hear God for yourself, to read his word for yourself and to know the truth in God's word and to receive guidance, wisdom, direction. And all that we need is found already in him. Would you lift your hands with me for a moment, church? Would you make this prayer with me and say, Lord, please birth in me a hunger today for the things of the kingdom of God. Help me not to be satisfied with all the fleeting things that this world offers. I pray that the deep will call unto the deep today. Heavenly Father, today morning I have set before your people 
something you placed in my heart, something that we need to do often, which is to examine ourselves, examine our hearts. And I pray if any of us who are here today have gone cold, have become withdrawn in our walk with you, have kind of drifted apart from walking with you, I pray that today there will be a clear call that will go forth today. I pray, Lord, that every person who has heard this word today will respond by saying, I'm going to draw closer. I'm going to lean forward. I'm going to come closer into this intimacy, this relationship that Christ offers. And I'm going to experience all that he has for my life in fullness. I pray, Father God, that there will be a special desire and a hunger that will be birthed in us as a church. May it be said that we were a generation that pursued you with all that we had, that we have seen your incredible glory and power in our days, Father God. I pray, Lord, that you will touch, speak, minister to, strengthen everyone who's in this service, wherever they are. I pray, Lord, that there will be no condemnation from this word, but rather that clear call for change in habits, change in the way that things are done so that we will be coming back to you and to walk with you. Bless everyone who is here. Strengthen them with your special grace. We thank you for you are such a faithful God. There's no one who is as faithful as you are. Even in our unfaithfulness, you remain constant, Father God. What an incredible Heavenly Father we have. I pray that your love will surround every person. And I pray for peace of God, the passive understanding to fill our hearts this morning. Bless everyone today with your peace and your strength. We give you glory honor and praise in the sweet name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Come on, church. Let's honor God. He's worthy to be praised. Amen. God bless you.